The name I chose for my blog is not just some paleo diet pun. I also have a small but healthy obsession with all things Neanderthal. Today I'm going to broach the topic by giving an overview of three different groups of Neanderthals in fiction. I'm Charlie Hudson and you are watching Neanderthal. Ah, oh, we're just gonna have to fire feckin' stat it again, Brad. Damn it! Damn it! Stat it again, Brad. Today I'm going to compare fictional Neanderthals from three different authors. From the Neanderthal Parallax trilogy, we have Barasts. From Clan of the Cave Bear and the Girl Who Invented Everything series, we have the Clan. And from Dance of the Tiger, we have the Whites, with a brief cameo by the Reds. I want to keep this short, so let's get to it. Now, at least in the past, there has been some disagreement over whether Neanderthals had language. Recent evidence suggests that, at the very least, they would have been unable to pronounce the E phoneme, like E in Mary. So where do our authors come down on the question of Neanderthal language? Well, first, they all agree that Neanderthals had language, hence their group names, but all three, to varying degrees, do limit the Neanderthal ability to vocalize. But, each author does make up for this limitation by giving their Neanderthals another dimension for communication. Robert J. Sawyer, the most contemporary author, withholds only the E phoneme, and in exchange, he gives them conscious awareness of pheromones. Jean M. Owl, the second of these three authors withholds many sounds, but she gives a rich and subtle language of gestures in return. Bjorn Curtin only allows the whites to use the vowel sounds a ah and o, oh, but in return he imagines a richly musical language. So, now that our Neanderthals can speak, what do they call their sapien sapien cousins? Glixins, others, and blacks, and sometimes gods and devils. And in return, what do homo sapien sapiens call the Neanderthals? Neanderthals, flatheads, and finally, and I think this one is very appropriate and deserving of further scholarship, Trolls. Now everyone agrees that Neanderthals were different from modern humans. Their skulls were shaped a little differently, with pronounced brow ridges, bigger noses, and a cranial capacity that was over 10% larger than ours. So, based on these cranial differences, what superpowers did our authors bestow upon their Neanderthals. There is a canine sense of smell, hence the pheromone communication, then a remarkable faculty for Lamarckian memory, and finally, 10th level politeness. Of course, Neanderthals didn't just have bigger brains and bigger noses. Everyone agrees that they carried a lot more muscle than modern humans as well. With this in mind, what was the greatest feat of strength performed by the fictional Neanderthals? On page 127 of Book 2 of the Neanderthal Parallax, in self-defense, Ambassador Tukana Pratt 
slams an assailant's skull against the pavement, the front of his head breaking open like a ripe melon. On page 661 of The Plains of Passage, book four in The Girl Who Invented Everything series, Guban, with a badly broken leg, manages to hold off six assailants, at one point lifting and throwing one man into another. Finally, on page 220 of Dance of the Tiger, we hear secondhand how Mr. Mare's tail, his body full of enemy spears, rips a man's head clean off with his bare hands, like a child plucking a flower. So, there is clear agreement that Neanderthals were the stronger race. But the authors disagree over who was faster. Robert J. Sawyer makes his Neanderthals speedier, even in the middle distances where the fastest modern runners have physiques like this. Jean M. Owl makes her Cro-Magnons faster than the Neanderthals, even over shorter distances, where some of the fastest runners look like this. I don't remember Curtin taking a position, which was perhaps wise. All three authors make their Neanderthals behave a little differently from their cousins, the Sapiens Sapiens. The first big question is, do the women hunt? Generally, no, but on occasion, yes. Most emphatically, not. And yes, though perhaps slightly less often than the males. Who runs Neanderthal society? In classifying Sawyer's Barast Society, I learned a new word, gerontocracy, a society where leadership is reserved for the elders. Thanks, Wikipedia. Owl's clan, meanwhile, is a patriarchy, while Curtin's whites and reds live in matriarchal groups. But these questions don't capture the spirit of these characters. So here's another question. Which group of humans, Neanderthals or Sapiens, would contemporary PC liberals swoon over? In Sawyer's world, it would have to be the Barasts, who are Spock-like, ecologically-minded socialists. In Owl's universe, on the other hand, it would have to be the Others, because the clan are narrow-minded social conservatives. In Curtin's world, the whites would have some appeal as peaceful flower children, but their manners and social customs make the inhabitants of Downton Abbey look downright uncouth. And they would not be TED Talk listening, Kickstarter funding bandwagoners. For PC liberals, the whites would be like the Amish, a curiosity to be appreciated and perhaps preserved, but not a group you'd marry into. Finally, we're going to have to talk about intelligent design. Of course, the Neanderthals in our universe were the product of evolution, but the Neanderthals in these books were created by intelligent beings and placed in their worlds to play certain roles and fulfill specific destinies. So the question is, what is the primary function and purpose of the Neanderthals in these works of fiction? The primary function of the Barasts is to shame modern human readers for the violence, greed, and irrationality of their contemporaries. The primary function for the members of the clan is to play the foils in a late 1970s women's liberation fantasy story. And 
Most tragically, the role of the Whites is to play the victims in an extinction mystery novella. All of these works have their strengths and weaknesses. Though they do come to different conclusions at times, all three authors have clearly done their homework. Sawyer's science fiction trilogy must be credited as the most original. There were a few things that irritated me, but I thoroughly enjoyed book one and the second half of book three. I have and will probably continue to poke some fun, but Owl uses her knowledge of the Paleolithic to breathe life into a fantasy world that is as rich as any in modern fiction. Once I learned to identify and quickly skim past the sections that didn't interest me, I devoured these books. I do have to admit, though, I don't plan to read books five and six. They're no Neanderthals. Though one of the major premises of the book appears to have been disproven, Dance of the Tiger is the book I can recommend with the fewest reservations. It is by far the shortest work, but like an Agatha Christie novella, nothing is missing. And like The Hobbit, it combines the intimacy of oral storytelling with a richness that comes from referencing a wider world of mythology. This is an excellent book, and I highly recommend it. Okay, that wasn't terrible. Boom. <clears throat> Boom.